Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight, I'm continuing in the study of the book of John. And I'm going to pick up where I left off last time. It'll be chapter 10, verse 1. Now, if you have not seen the previous studies on John, uh, the first nine chapters are they're already uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I really hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. But for now, I'll, I'll start with chapter 10, verse 1. I'm a KJV firstist, so I look at it first in the KJV. I will probably look at it in the Amplified also because sometimes I find that to be helpful to me. So let's begin. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door in the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Let's read that in the Amplify and see how it phrases it. Verses 1 and 2. Uh, these are in red letters. That means that they, the translators believe these are the actual words of Jesus. So Jesus says, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up from some other place on the stone wall, uh, that one is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep, the protector and provider. So this goes along with Jesus' claim when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So he's saying that there's one way to enter, one way to to get into the kingdom of God, and that is by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. And so it says that if you try to get in some other way, then you're a robber, you're a thief. Uh, it's and you're illegitimate, it won't work. And let's look at this in the KJV verse three. It says, to him, the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. So Jesus in, in this is uh, would be the shepherd, and the sheep are the believers in Jesus. Uh, verse 5 says, A stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of the stranger. Uh, how do we know the voice of Jesus? How do we know if it's not a stranger? Some people think that they are going to listen to the Holy Spirit, uh, and, and uh, that's how they know how to go and which what, what is the truth. But the Bible warns us that there are many spirits, and they're out to deceive us, and we must test the spirits. How do we test them? We test them by the scriptures. So really what we need to determine, uh, we use to determine that uh, if is, this is the shepherd or uh, a deceiver, then we use the scriptures. Uh, we recognize his voice because he's say, telling us what is in the scriptures. If someone is telling us something that's contrary to the scriptures, then we will know that this is not Jesus at all, but this is a stranger. And verse 6 says, This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Again, these parables, uh, Jesus said there's a reason he spoke in parables. Uh, it was not intended for people to understand unless their heart was right. If people had a, a humble um, mindset, then they would understand the parables. But if they were full of self-righteousness and pride, they just wouldn't get it. That's why the Pharisees couldn't understand what he was saying. Many people couldn't understand. And right here it says, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them, 
over and over again, we see people not understanding. And Jesus keeps on saying that, don't you understand that I'm speaking to you in spiritual language? Uh, verse 7 says, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. So Jesus is, we think of him in a lot of different ways uh, in regarding salvation. Uh, he's the door. He's the gate. He's the, nar he's the narrow way. Uh, uh, he is the living water. He is the bread of life. All these things are uh, different ways to understand who he is and that he is the sole source of life everlasting. Verse 8 says, All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Uh, the ones that came before him, there were others who claimed that uh, they were the Messiah. Jesus was not, what, not the first uh, uh, to, to make that claim and say the scriptures, when the scriptures speak of a Messiah, I am he. Well, Jesus is now making that claim, but others have made that claim before. He says, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Uh, there's there's one door. Uh, think of it as a heaven as being having only one door, one way to enter, and Jesus is the door. We get into heaven through Jesus. He's the door. He's the way. We believe in him, and, and heaven opens up to us, and we receive eternal life in heaven as a free gift from Jesus. But <laughs> uh, some people think that there's a back door and there's a side door. There's other ways. Most people think that uh, the, the way people really get in is, is they make their own door. They build the door through their own efforts, uh, through religious works. And, and, and if they can do well enough and they can claim self-righteousness, then that's the way to get in. But uh, Jesus said, no, there's no other way. Jesus is the only way. It says, um, uh, verse 10 says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Well, I've, I've heard um, people use this verse here to support the prosperity gospel. That uh, don't you know that, you know, as Christians, Jesus didn't come just to save us, but to give us life more abundantly, to give us an abundant life. So they, they claim that Christians should be wealthy and healthy and successful and have everything in abundance. But I, I refer them to the Apostle Paul. Paul had an abundance of beatings with a stick. He had an abundance of lashes with a whip. He had an abundance of stones cast at him and being left for dead. He had abundance of persecution and suffering and finally uh, was beheaded. So you can think that every time someone puts their faith in Jesus that they're going to get an abundant life and the abundant life means blessings of galore. But he, Jesus also said that uh, uh, if they persecuted him, they're going to persecute us, us even more. So, yeah, yeah, you're going to have life and have it more abundantly. But that doesn't mean that your abundant life is going to be filled with nothing but blessings. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own, uh, who, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catches them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. Uh, let me read those verses in the Amplified. He says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his own life for the sheep. Of course, that's what Jesus did on the cross. 
Uh, but the hired man who merely serves for wages, who is neither the shepherd nor the owner of the sheep, when he sees the wolf coming, deserts the flock and runs away, and the, the wolf snatches the sheep and scatters them. So Jesus has does not have a relationship with this as just a hireling. He is the shepherd that loves the sheep. He loves them so much that uh, he would die for them, and he in fact did. Verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. So he knows us and we know him. Uh, and as the father knoweth me, even so know I the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And he did this willingly. He did not resist. He willingly laid down his life for the sheep. He could have called on uh, angels uh, to uh, defeat the soldiers uh, who were arresting him. Uh, he could have he could have just uh, uh, performed some miracle and, and made them turn them into a pillar of salt if he wanted to. But he willingly laid down his life. He knew the suffering and the death that was waiting him. And he did not resist. Verse 16, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. This is uh, verse 16 here is a, a Mormon verse. Mormons use this to try to support their claim that um, uh, besides the believers in the Middle East, that these uh, other sheep Jesus is referring to here are actually people in Central North America. <laughs> That's what you get from the Book of Moron, I mean, I mean the Book of Mormon. Um, but we, we, it's, it's pretty simple if you understand the Bible to know that the other sheep are the Gentiles. See, the, the Jews, they, they always believed that uh, the Messiah was coming just for the Jews and salvation was only for the Jews. And even after Jesus, after Jesus' death, burial, resurrection and ascension, in the beginnings of the church when the apostles were uh, getting it all started and established, even then, even the beginning, they didn't understand that Gentiles would be included and they didn't understand that Judaism must be left behind and discarded. These were the two mistakes of the early church and these had to be corrected. Uh, uh, first, the first apostle to the Gentiles was not Paul, it was Peter. Peter was sent to Cornelius, a Jewish man and his family, you know, to preach that to them. And they were the first Gentiles to get saved. Uh, and, uh, and, and when pre Jesus, when Peter was sent to, to Cornelius, he was told to eat with them too, eating non-Jewish food, non-kosher um, food that is forbidden. Uh, the, the Jewish people in Mosaic Law had strict uh, 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 strict laws on dietary laws. Uh, and yet, in, in a vision, Peter was told that, no, eat all these things, nothing's unclean. So this is the beginning of, of the revelation to Peter and then later to the whole church and to Paul that uh, uh, all the laws of Moses would be discarded. The dietary laws, the circumcision, the animal sacrifices in the temple, all these things must be discarded and left behind. But in the beginning, the, the beginning church didn't realize that. And this was a gradually revealed to them. And the book of Acts is often referred to as a transitional book because it went from Judaism to Judaism that believed in Jesus and then people who believed in Jesus and left Judaism behind. Uh, but this verse 16 it says, and, um, and other sheep I have, that is a reference to the Gentiles. So that this is the first indication that Jesus did not only come for the Jews, but for other sheep too, the Gentiles. Uh, and verse 17 says, therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. So he says, I'm laying down my life, but I will take it again. I will take my life back. 
He takes it back by raising himself back to life. That is, and he also says that I might take it again. So this is one of the verses where it says that Jesus is raising himself to life. He is resurrecting himself. There's also verses that say that the Holy Spirit raised Jesus and the Father raised Jesus. And it, I believe this is certainly an indication that this is a joint effort. They all cooperate in this resurrection. Uh, in verse 17, uh, verse 18, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. In other words, they, they, they arrested him and they cru crucified him, but he said, no man can take it from me. In other words, they can't, they weren't taking his life as they believed. The, uh, the, uh, San, the Sanhedrin and, and then the Romans, uh, they thought that they were in, in control, but he says, no, I lay it down myself. He could have stopped them at any moment, but he knew his the reason for coming, the reason for becoming a man was so that he could die. He couldn't die if he remained in heaven as, as uh, the word. Uh, he had to come and be manifest in the flesh as um, God-man, uh, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Uh, he had to have this uh, humanity in order to die. Um, it says in verse 18, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Verse 19, there was a division, therefore, again among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said, he hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, these are not the words of him that hath a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? So again, they're arguing about uh, his claims, whether they believed his claims or not. And when he when he says things that uh, they needed spiritual ears and uh, the, a humble heart to understand. Many of these people didn't understand it, and and uh, they did not accept his claims. And they said he must be mad. He must be uh, possessed by a devil. Um, and then some did believe him, as you can see. This argument is going on in verse twenty-two. It says, "And it was at Jerusalem the feast of the dedication, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple of Sol in Solomon's porch." <clears throat> then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. They keep on demanding signs. He keeps on giving them signs. He keeps on performing miracles. Then he claims, I'll give you an ultimate sign, the resurrection after you kill me. Uh, and uh, But he says over and over again, uh, look, I keep on telling you, but you won't believe me. Um, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. This is one of the great eternal security verses in the Bible. He says, I give unto them eternal life. Uh, those people who believe him, he gives them eternal life, and they shall never perish. This is a, a promise from Jesus that if you believe in me, you will never perish. That means you'll never end up going into hell, into the second death and the lake of fire and perishing. You don't have to worry about that. I guarantee it. So that means that no matter what you do in the future, uh, if you uh, become a like the, the backslidden son that left the father and got into trouble and went into the pig's pen and got into all this mischief, and, uh, or, or if you even lose your faith, no matter what you do, I will not allow you to perish. He says, no one can pluck you out of my hand. He's got a hold of you, and he's going to take you to heaven because you put your faith in him. He's guaranteed, I'm getting you to heaven no matter what. Uh, verse 29, my father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. So Jesus has you in his hand. The father has you in his hand, and no one can pluck you out. And Here's an illustration of 
uh, Jesus says, I hold you in the palm of my hand. So here you have Jesus grabbing hold of you and never letting go. No one can pluck you out. And you embrace Jesus. You put your faith in Jesus. So you've embraced him and he's holding on to you. And you got into sin, but he won't let go of you. You lost your faith, but he remains faithful, the Bible says. He cannot deny himself. So this is not dependent upon you. This is dependent upon him. He promises you. No one can pluck you out of his hand. He promises you that he will never leave you or forsake you. And, he, and he's got a grip on you. You're going to heaven because you put your faith in Jesus. And then he says in verse 30, I and my father are one. Now, this verse can mean a lot of different things. The, the modalist, those uh, Sabellians, uh, they, they, uh, they believe that uh, they are one and the same person. Jesus says, I and my father are one and the same person. In other words, I am the father. I am the son. I am the Holy Spirit. That's modalism. It's just Jesus is the Jesus only uh, viewpoint that uh, only Jesus is God and he just sometimes wears a mask as the father and sometimes he, he wears a mask as the son and sometimes he puts on the Holy Spirit mask and he operates in these different modes as Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, but he's truly, just, but he's just really just one person. That's modalism, and a modalist would use this verse to to argue for their position. But in the tr Trinitarian viewpoint says, "I and my Father are one," and that means that we are one and of one substance. We are the essence of, of the Godhead. We are God. We're one and the same in that respect. Uh, and uh, and then uh, some people would argue who do not believe in the deity of Christ that they would say I and my father are one means of one mind we're just in agreement but uh, the, the position of the church is that I and my father are of one substance one essence we are truly God uh, so now let's look at verse 31 it says then the Jews took up stones again to stone him now why would they stone him after he said I and my father are one the same reason they wanted to stone him before several times. Every time he makes a claim that could be interpreted no other way except a claim of deity, a claim that he is God. That's the, why they stone him, for blasphemy. They want to stone him. Uh, G, G, the verse 32, Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So I don't know how clear it has to be for you, those people who say Jesus is just a prophet, he's not God. Uh, Jesus is claiming to be God. The Jews understood his claims, and they say right here, uh, we're going to stone you for blasphemy because you are just a man, but you make it yourself to be God. So Jesus is claiming deity. Uh, and they don't believe him, so they want to stone him for blasphemy. And Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, Ye are gods. This is a quote for verse 34. Let me see. This goes back to uh, the Old Testament. Uh, he says, is it not written in your law? So this would go back to the, when the first five books of Moses is called the law, and then the remaining books are called the prophets. So uh, somewhere in the books of Moses, he's quoting from there. But but uh, this is, uh, if you look at this in context, the people who are saying that at that time, uh, is it's a sarcastic comment. They like, they think, oh, you think you're, you think you're God. You think you're all of that, but uh, not because Jesus is actually saying uh, that uh, uh, Jesus answered, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. Jesus is not saying that you're all gods. I'm, I'm God and you're all gods. That's like a, uh, the, 
and uh, another viewpoint that, that people have, particularly in the New Age religions, that we're all God. Uh, but no, Jesus is not making that claim. He's just quoting the Old Testament to confound them. Uh, verse 35 says, If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him, whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. So he's offering his works as proof that his claim of deity is true. And he says in verse 38, But if I do, though ye believe me, not me, believe the works. See, the Jews always demanded a sign. And yet he gives them miracle after miracle after miracle. And some of them say, well, these, the only reason you can do miracles is because you're possessed by the devil and you're doing the miracles through the, through the, the devil is working through you. So no matter what he does, some of these people are just never going to be satisfied. Verse 39, therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. He continues escaping out of their hand because, as he said earlier, it's not his time. If it was his time, they would grab him, arrest him, and then he'd be put on trial and, uh, and uh, crucified, and that eventually happens. But this is not the time, so he escapes out of their hand. Verse 40, and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true and many believed on him there. Okay, so that's the conclusion of chapter 10. Um, all right, I want to, I'll pick up with chapter 11 next time, but for now, let me, uh, let me give a, a, a short explanation of the gospel. The word gospel is Greek word. It, it just simply is translated as good news. So if someone wants to share the gospel with you, they want to share the good news. In fact, it's, it's, it's so good. The news is so good that uh, it's, it's great news. It's the greatest news you'll ever hear. And it, it, it is simply that um, Jesus loves you so much that he is offering you not just you individually, but you as a whole, every person. He offers every single person in the world eternal life in heaven as a free gift. Now, if you were not aware of that, you might be quite surprised by that statement. But that's what the Bible says. Jesus says over and over again, you'll have life everlasting if you'll believe in me. Believe in him. That means to believe in his ability to save you and give you life everlasting in heaven. Do you believe he's able? Do you believe that he is not only able, but the only one who is able? He is the only way to get to heaven. He claimed he's the one and only way. Uh, then, if you believe that he is able, and he promises to give you life everlasting, if you'll trust him, do you believe that he's trustworthy, that he's faithful? Can you put your... Be confident in his keeping his promise. The Bible says God cannot break a promise. God cannot lie. So when you believe in Jesus for salvation, it means you believe in his ability to get you to heaven and you believe in his faithfulness to keep the promise. That, uh, and that, therefore, if you believe that, you're not only saved, but you have this blessed assurance. You, 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 you can rest assured. You should be just joyful every day because you know you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven because you trusted Jesus. But most people don't either understand this or believe, believe what I just told you. Uh, this is what I call biblical Christianity, the type of Christianity that you find in the Bible. But this Christianity in the Bible is, is not really what you find in most churches in America today or even around the world. Okay. Christianity that's taught in churches is a, a religious system. Uh, re religion is simply a system of things that you're required to do in order to satisfy God 
so that through your good works, you can earn heaven. That's based, you get into heaven based upon what you do. But biblical Christianity is not based upon what you do. It's based on you trusting what Jesus did for you. What did he do? He came down from heaven and became a man. He died on a cross to pay for all of our sins. And he succeeded. He paid for all of our sins. Sin is paid for. And, and not only the sins you've paid, you've done in your life up till now, but the, the sins in the future that you perform. All sins. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, all of our sins were future sins. So the sins you've commit in your whole life have already been paid for by Jesus. Believe that. And that's why you get to go to heaven because he paid for your sins with his death, death on the cross. Also believe that he was buried in the tomb for three days, but he was raised to life bodily on the third day. That's what it said in this chapter here. It said, he said that he would raise himself to life. And, and he made this claim numerous times. When the Jews demanded a sign to prove his claims were true, his claims that he's God and that he's the Savior and that he has the power over life and death, prove it. Well, Jesus said, the only sign I will give you is the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And the Bible says he was talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. So he did raise himself to life bodily, out of the tomb, not just a spirit walking about, but a body, flesh and flesh and bones, the scripture says. Now, this resurrection is very important uh, because it, it's the sign that Jesus did in order to give us confidence that our faith in him is justified. Now, after he raised himself to life and he walked bodily on the earth for 40 days among 500 witnesses. They saw him, they talked to him, they touched him, they ate with him. So you can feel confident that he did raise himself to life and proved he is God, he is savior, and he does have the power to give you life everlasting in heaven and you have received it if you put your faith in him. I hope you did. If not, I hope you will do now. Call on the name of the Lord and say, Jesus, save me. I'm going to depend on you. A Christian is just a person who is, is depends completely on Jesus for their salvation. They're not trying to get to heaven some other way through religious efforts or through self-righteousness. They, they've given up on that and say, that can't work. I'm going to depend on Jesus instead. Thank you for watching. And I hope you will join me nightly for these studies. Uh, Bible Talk with Brother Luke nightly. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.